Verse 12, please. Now his brothers have gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, 37, 12. 12. Did, did I? No, go ahead. You're right. Okay. Come. I'm going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to him, Go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks, and bring word back to me. Then he sent him off to the valley, from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, What are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they are grazing their flocks? Okay, real quickly, Shechem is where they killed the entire city. When uh, Shechem and his son defiled Dinah, the daughter, Dinah, uh, that is, they killed the entire city. So now, obviously, what was his name? Uh, Israel, Jacob, was worried that they were going to be an odor in everybody's nose, and it says, but the Lord put a great fear on all the people, and they left them alone. They obviously feel secure enough to go back up to Shechem now with their flocks, and uh, I think I talked about in this class the, the rotation of the, uh, the land as they, they feed the, the flocks. Did I bring that up in here? Is that uh, uh, it, they have to go great distances, especially back then before they had irrigation with these flocks because the flocks eat and there's not a lot at certain times of the year. There is not a lot of grass. And so they literally eat everything down. And so they had to go great distances. And that's why we hear about um, Lot having to divide, divide from Abraham. And they had to separate. And we see this again somewhere else. Um, there are too many of you. Uh, Abimelech said that to Isaac. It's because the land simply could not support them, especially at certain times of the year. You have the former rains, you have the latter rains, and then you have a dry season. And uh, there are, especially in the more arid areas, and they do this to this day, and I, I, I'm sure I brought this up in this class, and if I have, just shut me up, but starting in Saudi Arabia, the Bedouins pretty much are allowed to go anywhere. They, they, there's no borders, there's no cross checks or anything, and they take their flocks and they walk. It takes 300 years for them to follow this circle all the way up through Israel, and then they come back down, and by the time that 300 years is over, there's enough vegetation to support these people. And they do this giant move of them and their flocks and they have just enough for themselves to support their families. They don't, you know, it's not like they get into a city and they start breeding and there's lots of them. And so these people have been doing this for thousands of years now. And about every 300 years they're back where they're two or three or four or five generations before were. It's just, an, it, Zvi told us, I don't know if you remember that, but interesting, and these people are totally free to go wherever they want. They just, Bedouins, they're the guys that live in the tents and they, you know, just old cow, uh, not cow, uh, you know, lamb wool and camel wool and all that kind of stuff. And the funny thing is though, that you will see nowadays when you go out in the middle of absolutely nowhere, you'll be going down a highway and you'll see them off in the distance and there'll be a satellite dish sitting outside of this tent. <laughs> and people running around, you know, it just uh, almost, prehistoric looking people and they're just out there it's crazy you know they're wearing these little black things and the, the hot desert sun is you know. did you have a question or no you were full. okay um, all right so that that is what we're talking about here when they went up to Shechem and then um, let me see if there's anything else I want to give you out of here I'll show you to them here I am uh, go through, um, so he's sending his brother up to find his brothers and um, verse 17 go ahead they have moved on from there the man asked. I heard them say, uh, let's go down to Dothan. Dothan, yep. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. Okay, I got to tell you something about Dothan before we uh, go on. Dothan is mentioned again in... Um, I, I, I think it's when Elisha the prophet is there and uh, uh, the king of... Uh, Aram or whatever... He says, who is it that's, uh, who is in my court that's telling the uh, king of Israel what's going on? And the king of Israel says, um, or his, his people said, no, there's a prophet that lives down in Israel and he knows the very words that are spoken in your bedroom. Okay, and he says, well, go get this guy for me. So he sends down all this mass of people and that's when Gehazi, Elisha's servant, says um, they're in Dothan. And it says, um, uh, or maybe they're in Shechem at the time, and it says, go to Dothan. Anyway, it says, go to Dothan. So they're in this area, and um, 
uh, that's when Gehazi says, look at all these people. And the Lord, or, or Elisha, I think it's Elisha, prays. Maybe it's Elijah. It's one of the two. He prays and he says, Lord, open the eyes. Greater are the number that are with us than are with them. And he looked out and he saw all the fiery chariots around him, protecting him as a prophet of God. Anyway, but I just have to tell you this because it's such a funny story. Go to Dothan. All right. So I'm getting ready to go around the country last year. And I got an email from Dothan, Alabama. And I have, my, my daily Bible verse goes out all around the world. I got people in like 15, 20 different countries that read it. But Dothan, Alabama, there's like dozens and dozens of people that had signed up for it. And I had no idea who they were, or why they were getting it. Dothan. Anyway, before I left, I get an email and it says, I, 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 my Bible reading for the morning was that passage and it said, go to Dothan. And the first email I opened up that morning was uh, from a girl from Dothan saying, when you go around the country, I want you to stop here. Uh, uh, my friend works at the uh, Christian radio station. We want to interview you. So it was the very last place I went in the nation before I came back here. So I stopped and spent two days, in, or actually a day and a half in Dothan. But just one of those crazy things that happens in life, you know. Anyway, hopefully somebody heard something on the radio that inspired them. And, and, uh, but I, every time I see the name Dothan in the Bible now, I think four times mentioned, I, it, it makes me laugh. So there you go. A little story about Dothan. Please, 18. Where was the verse about seeing all the chariots? Okay, it's, um, you go ahead and read 18, and I'll see if I can find it. Um. So Joseph went after the and found him in Dothan. But they saw him in the distance. Before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Okay, does that give you a picture of anything else? Are you thinking of anything else when you read that? Envy. The what? Envy. Well, but, but what specifically is, are we, uh, remember there's the brothers of Joseph, and they're plotting to kill him. Remember, everything pictures one thing in the Bible. Everything. Jesus. It says it again and again. They plotted to kill him. The Pharisees and the, the people in the, the, the fields and all that. And you'll find these 12 tribes. Wherever he goes, it says they plotted to kill him. They plotted to kill him. So keep that in mind as you're reading that. Everything about Joseph now is going to be a picture of Jesus. And it is full of it. We're, I'll forget 99% of them. We're going to skip over so many. But every thing about Joseph from this point until the time that he's out of the picture is now about Jesus. And everything, the inserts real quickly into the life of Joseph. We're going to get into Judah and Tamar. Okay? It's, it suddenly stops Joseph for a minute, goes to Judah and Tamar. Like, why is the story in here? Because it starts pointing about Jesus. And then we get back to Joseph. Now Joseph's life is about Jesus again. Anyway, so they're plotting to kill him. Go ahead and uh, I'm looking for that while you... Um, okay, it's 2 Kings 2.11. Let me get that real quickly. Just so that you, I want to make sure I've got the right one, and then we'll uh, keep reading. 2 Kings 2.11. 2, 2 Kings 2. What a neat story that is. 2 Kings 2, verse 11. Then it happened as they continued and talked that suddenly, oh no, that's not the right one. That's Jerry to fire when he went up to heaven. Um, go ahead, uh, keep reading, and I'll see if I can find this. Here comes that dream, they said, Come now, let us kill him and throw him into the one, one of those cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into this cistern here in the desert, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the richly ornamented robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. Now the cistern was empty. Okay, before we go on, the richly ornamented robe that was taken off of him, mm -hmm. any picture there? Yeah. His seamless garment, his expensive garment was taken from him. Okay, I, I know I missed something because I was looking for that, and I'll look for it later so I don't get diverted too much. But once again... His brothers are taking what belongs to him. And just so you know, I don't know if this is true, but I might as well tell you, seeing as how I brought it up, is that if this is true, and sometimes people say things that are kind of, you know, flowery in sermons, but sometimes it is correct, and you have to kind of discern which, but it's, it is at least taught that the robe that Jesus wore, it's described as seamless, it's one piece, and it was blah, blah, blah. 
that would have been a present from his mother. She, that would have been something that he made for her. And so it would have had great value not only as a, uh, because of the way it was made, because that kind of garment was expensive, but it would have had great value because of who gave it to him. I don't know if that's true, but it's an interesting uh, uh, commentary in a sermon I heard. Anyway, um, so they've taken him, they've stripped him, and they've thrown him into a well. All picturing Jesus in one way or another. Jesus was eventually thrown into a grave. You can't get into exact... There's one thing about pictures and types is it can't be specific because if it is, then it's the story, right? Something has to be veiled. If it said they took him and nailed him to a tree, and it, well, obviously, you know, that's not what happens in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is telling us something is going to happen similar to it. And that's, so you can't make exact parallels 99% of the time, but they are good parallels. And as I said yesterday, Alfred Adersheim found 456 references to Christ in the Old Testament. We found, what, 15 in the, the verse yesterday. And in the life of Joseph alone, there's probably 70. I mean, 456 is not a big number. Yes? I have to get the projector. Oh, please, here. Where is it? Don't worry about that at all. We've got one back here. Is there something? Oh, projector. Yeah. Oh, I, I'm thinking of the TV. Anyway, don't worry about that. We're just in I here. Apologize. If you'd like, please take, take some long gants on the way out of here. They're delicious. Oh, they're, they're just so... Did anybody eat any of them yet? Are they good? Yeah. Oh, good. Uh, I knew you'd like them. Nobody... I don't know how anybody couldn't like them. Okay, so please, go ahead where you were. Now the cistern was empty. There was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. Okay, who are the Ishmaelites? I didn't mean to cut you off. I, I thought you finished that one. Who are the Ishmaelites? They're the sons of Ishmael. So they're, they're relatives. They're uh, the sons of Abraham through Ishmael, not through Isaac. They're not the covenant people, but they are relatives. And so, you know, even what they did was wrong, and they don't know who these people are. They know that they are Ishmaelites, and they're within the family. So they would assume that he would get proper care. Okay, whoever decided this, let's not kill him. We can make some money out of him. And uh, who was it that, uh, was it Reuben? Uh, Reuben heard it and he delivered him out of their hands and said, let's not kill him. What did Reuben do before? Remember we talked about Reuben already? He was naughty in his father's bed. That's right. He's the one that went up and slept with Bilhah, his father's concubine, or his father's, you know, whatever you want to call her. So Reuben was complicit in what happened here, so, but he's trying to get his life straightened out. All right, let's not kill the boy. All right, so... There is some redeeming qualities about Reuben, but when we get to his blessing, it's not going to be a great one. That's in Genesis 49, I believe. Anyway, um, uh, go ahead. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. Okay, now Jesus was sold for how many pieces of silver? 30, that's right. And that is brought in later in the book of Jeremiah through the, the, the things, the hefty price or whatever, the whatever price you paid for me and throw it to the potter and all that. Anyway, it doesn't matter that it's not a perfect parallel. He was sold for pieces of silver. The reason why it's 20 here is because that was the going rate for slaves at the time. Later, the price for a slave went up to 30. But that is another parallel of Christ being sold by his own brothers, by the people with him, his apostle, for silver. Okay, he was betrayed. Um, Midian traders passed by, but Joseph picked him up out of the pit and sold him to Ishmaelites. Okay, so he sold there and took Joseph to Egypt. Now, before we go on, is any of this a surprise to God? No. And what is it that Joseph is going to say when his brothers finally know who he is? He's going to use some very beautiful words. What's he going to say? Absolutely. This is all part of God's plan and his purpose. And so if you can take these particular verses where you see the affliction that he's going through right now, 
the hatred by his brothers. You can take what's going to happen to him, his obedience, and yet he's punished for it by uh, Potiphar's wife for something he didn't do. And then he goes to jail and he spends time there. And all of the misery and suffering that he is facing, 